Well, good afternoon and welcome to Litson Motors here in Forest City, Iowa, where we're literally only one mile north of the Winnebago, Itasca, and Winnebago Touring Coach Division of Winnebago Industries here in Forest City, Iowa. We have a very exciting webcast today and we have with us a couple of guests that I want to introduce here in a moment. But um, today what we're actually going to cover is literally how to winterize your RV, which is kind of an appropriate day because here in Forest City we had our first snow flurries of the year, which is a little discouraging for us given the fact that we are probably about 80% complete with our all new RV dealership uh, scheduled to open with the sales showroom uh, later next month. So we're really excited about that. Um, I also want to welcome just a couple of people behind the scenes. Uh, Josh Dam is our special events and marketing director. And we have one of our shining stars of our service department, Brad Buffington, with us today, uh, who is one of our uh, factory trained RV service technicians here at our dealership. Uh, in a pre previous life, uh, Brad actually worked for Winnebago Industries, now works for us here at uh, Litson Motors. And Brad is going to walk you through how to winterize your RV for the upcoming season. And we're going to take all of your questions live. So one thing I want to do is cover a couple of housekeeping items. Um, today we can communicate with you uh, through our live chat function. So if you actually log in in the lower right hand corner of your screen uh, by very simply just putting in your first name, you can actually chat questions directly to my tablet and we'll cover those as we go. Uh, I want to welcome all of you here today. Uh, we are broadcasting live on our HD channel. Uh, we have about 580 viewers today, which is actually our largest webcast, which is kind of appropriate because uh, Brad's claim of fame is that he has the single highest performing YouTube video on our channel in terms of winterizing your RV. I also want to throw a couple of other things out for you. Um, throughout the webcast, if you have specific questions, again, chat them directly to us. However, if you want to send me a picture, a question, a video specific to your RV, uh, very simply uh, text it to me. I'm going to give you my personal cell phone. It's area code 612-599-9263. We'll cover that actually as we go. You can also email me questions afterwards. I'll get with Brad and we'll get right back to you. That's very simply ron at litson.com. Also keep in mind after the webcast, we can actually do a live interactive presentation with you in the comfort of your home or office with any of our sales professionals here at Litson Motors. But that's enough housekeeping items. Let's go ahead and turn the microphone over to Brad Buffington. Uh, Brad is one of our factory trained RV service technicians. And Brad, before we get started, I got a couple of questions for you. First, tell all of us one thing that nobody knows about you. Nobody? What is your deepest, hidden, darkest secret? I still mourn the loss of my childhood dog, Tuffy. Wow, he's a mourner. <laughs> Who is your favorite pro football team? The Minnesota Vikings. And are you a true fan or a Fairweather fan, given the state of the state? Um, a disgusted bleeding gold and purple fan. Cool, so he's a true fan. We're in the uh, frozen tundra of the Midwest. So again, welcome Brad. Brad's gonna walk us through uh, how to winterize your RV. Um, also keep in mind, we're gonna try to keep things very simple for you because uh, a lot of you out there are do-it-yourselfers. We get a lot of questions on winterization throughout the course of the season and also how to de-winterize because we also have a summarizing video um, also on our YouTube channel and in our video library on Litson.com that you can look forward to as, as things warm up next spring. But Brad's going to walk us through one of the two different methods. Uh, you can either do the dry method where in simple terms you blow the coach out. Uh, we're also going to cover the wet method today which is what we're going to cover from inside the coach here uh, which is the uh, function of using RV antifreeze. So I'm going to turn the mic over to Brad and we're going to go ahead and get going again. Chat in your questions live. One of the greatest successes we've had is to try to make these uh, live webcast as interactive as possible. So again, welcome to you all. Brad, the floor is yours. <clears throat> okay, well first of all, we'll discuss uh, just some um, straightforward theory on what we need to do. Um, first of all, we want to get rid of all the water that we have stored on board. So if we think of that in terms of getting rid of our black, our gray water, draining your fresh water tank, draining your water heater, uh, most units have one or two uh, low point drain locations. We can open those up and that will allow water to gravity uh, to use gravity to flow out of the lines. Um, so if we've done those things, we've gotten rid of <clears throat> most of the water that we have stored on board. Then uh, we need to go to the water heater and put the water heater in bypass. 
once the water heater is in bypass, we can then either blow out the water lines or use the RV antifreeze siphon um, hose that's usually provided at the water pump location. And, and, and Brad, if I can just interrupt, and I'm going to interrupt as we go, but um, one question that we get oftentimes is why do we even have a water heater bypass? Um, by putting the water heater in bypass, and I have a, a, a sample valve here that we can look at, um, your water heater bypass valve will be installed similarly like this. So if the valve is in line, we are allowing water to go to the water heater. Okay. If we put the valve up, we now would be sending water away from the water heater. Uh, when we do that, <clears throat> we can drain that water heater and then uh, if we're using RV antifreeze, we don't have to put six or ten gallons of antifreeze into that water heater before we got it into our hot supply lines. And that's a really good point because I think one thing that uh, most people tend to overlook, and this is true with uh, nearly all Winnebago coaches and most of the RV industry as a whole, is that when you actually fill your coach with water for the first time, it passes through the water heater first. So we include a water heater bypass valve so that we don't actually chalk the water heater full of six or ten gallons worth of RV antifreeze right out of the chute. So good point, thank you. So once we've got that bypass valve, and on this model um, we have it located, uh, this is the back side of the water heater. Uh, this particular model has a panel that we removed um, and then th the water heater is behind these um, vents and, and you can see the water lines here. I just brought a valve so we can look uh, more clearly at it, at it up here. And Brad, a lot of times that water heater bypass valve is located right on the back side of the water heater, correct? Yep, back side of the water heater or uh, sometimes Winnebago plums everything to a winterization panel um, uh, where there would be the RV antifreeze siphon uh, valve as well as the water heater bypass valve so they may be in locations like that and typically you'll see that actually in your utility center your um where your fresh water capacity is you'll actually see the siphon valve and it's typically on a white piece of sheet metal that shows your winterization package yep so uh having that water heater bypass now we are uh free from sending anything to there you've drained it later we'll go outside and look at at, at this water heater and we'll look at draining it um, then we would go to our uh, RV antifreeze siphon uh, valve and that's typically located pretty close to the water pump or like we've talked about with the bypass valve at a, a, a prepared panel. So you would find your valve and it usually has a clear hose similar to this one and uh, when the valve is in line we are, uh, are taking water from the freshwater tank and that's where uh, the water pump is getting its source. When we turn that valve up, pointing at that clear hose, then we are making that clear hose the source of your water pump. And we can put uh, the end of this clear hose in the RV antifreeze, and then the water pump will draw that through um, all of our water lines. So once we're prepared with that, then we would simply go to all of our water f um, faucets, the shower, the toilet, and we would run those um, till we got pink. And so we're actually cheated a little bit, we're, we're prepared, I just wanna demonstrate that here. We'll still go look at the water pump. And, and Brad, before you do that, and we'll get to that in a moment, I wanna cover two questions that first came in. Um, ben had a question, which I think is really a, a pretty valid one, and thank you for chatting that in, Ben. Wanting to know, he actually lives down south in Alabama. When is it most appropriate to winterize? I would say that you need to be winterized anytime the temperature is staying below that freezing point, 32 degrees, um, for more than half the day. I mean, if it's dipping down there at night and warming back into the 50s and 60s during the day, you'd probably be safe because it wouldn't heat soak that unit. But it, when it's staying down there for a long period of time and, and not warming up during the day, then you definitely need to be winterized. And with a lot of our Winnebago models, um, a lot of them in the RV industry will be considered basement <coughs> models. And, and by what that means is the fact that we have a residential floor plenum that runs throughout the coach, and we use some offshoots in the dampers to actually keep the lines inside from freezing. Now keep in mind, that's not a foolproof option because sometimes we'll have an outside shower or an outside city fill that's not actually within that heated and enclosed basement. So it varies a little bit based on model, but again, if you have some questions on that, um, you can always chat them into us uh, throughout this actual webcast, or you can always email them to me at ron at litson.com, 
And again, I think uh, our moderator had placed my cell phone actually in the chat uh, room. It's uh, area code 612-599-9, excuse me, 9263. Um, another question, um, Brad, that uh, Craig had actually just chatted in, wanting to talk a little bit more about draining the water heater. His question was, why not just actually utilize the water heater drain plug to drain the, the water heater? And I think that maybe there was some confusion with respect to the water heater bypass valve because we still have to drain the water heater, Craig, which um, I think is a really good question that you had just chatted in. Yep, we, did, we still have to do that. And we'll go out and look at the water heater. I just kind of want to cover the general theory while we're all right here at these locations. So yes, definitely drain the water heater. Um, when we drain the water heater, we open up the pressure relief valve, usually at the top, the blow off valve. That will release the pressure out of the water heater so that when you do go down to do the drain plug, it, you don't have the pressure of the water heater um, right at that drain plug and it won't shoot out and surprise you. Right. So we release it at the pressure relief valve um, and then open up the drain valve. And you know, this is something that off topic, you probably should be doing a couple of times a year because when we drain that water heater, we're allowing sediment out that may be trapped in the water heater. Um, and that's a, just a, a good maintenance type thing so you don't have that sediment build up in your water heater so that once a year when you do winterize, it all comes out or it's um, providing poor uh, water quality or taste. So I don't want to step on your toes, but is now a good time to jump outside to show the water here? It'd be perfect. And while we're doing that, uh, go ahead, Brad, we'll follow you. Uh, Dick had chatted in a question and we will cover winterizing the ice maker here in a moment. Um, so good question and we will cover that. So Josh is just right around the corner. So on this particular unit, uh, we got the cover off. Um, if you're in a unit uh, that has a, a sealed compartment door over it, um, and the water heater protrudes from the compartment door, uh, that simply has two screws down at the base, then that will allow the, that uh, compartment door to open up and uh, then you can get to the water heater just like this. And again, that's if it's not on a hinged um, setup like this, if it's actually a false front to the water heater. In the lower, yep. So here, I've got this one off. Uh, this is the pressure relief valve here. And so I simply operate this uh, lever on it and that would allow the pressure to be relieved from the water heater. A lot of times you'll see these described as a P and T valve, which is just an abbreviation for pressure and temperature relief valve. Yep. So we got that guy popped. Um, and then most uh, Winnebago water heaters, this is the setup I use. I use a socket and extension with my ratchet that will allow me in and around the gas valve. Um, this one here is very uh, accessible, so I, I don't have any problems with that. Um, and, and then we would just back it out. Now I've already, uh, I've already drained this water heater ahead of time so we didn't have a big mess and noise while we were videoing. Now this water heater has an anode rod. And so uh, when you're winterizing, it's a good opportunity to inspect your anode rod. Um, we wanna, this one here is uh, new this season. So we wanna inspect this material of the anode rod to make sure that uh, it hasn't um, all been dissolved or degraded. Um, and then it is mostly all there. Once that has started to degrade, uh, it's uh, an opportunity and a need to replace that anode rod um, at your next earliest convenience. But the, the purpose of an anode rod is, is to be a sacrificial material um, so that the minerals uh, and the makeup of the water doesn't attack the water heater, it attacks the anode rod. If your water heater does not have an anode rod, that's because it's an aluminum tank water heater and nothing is gonna attack that aluminum and so you don't need that. So if you have a steel end uh, on your drain plug, then you'll have an anode rod. If you have a, a, a white, hard neoprene plastic uh, drain plug, then you don't have one and you don't need one. And that's a really good point. <laughs> Thank you for explaining all that, Brad. Connie just chatted in a question, um, wanting to know what does a bad anode rod look like? When should we replace that? Well, this anode rod uh, has uh, an iron uh, rod as a center. Now, we just took one out the other day for a customer that we were winterizing and it was just the metal stick left. So theirs was completely gone. Um, you can see here, at, right at this plug, um, right in here, it has started to deteriorate. So 
this part of the anode rod is being used up. That's really helpful. When you see this section uh, continued on, um, there's a percentage off the top of my head, I don't know it right now, we could look that up and get back to you, get that posted. Um, but they're like six or seven dollars. So if you're at all in doubt or questioning it, it's a, an easy item to replace. And really what you're doing is you're preventing this type of wear on the steel casing of the actual water heater itself, where it's metal and not aluminum. So good question, Connie, thank you. Okay, so, and then when, when it's done draining and you're done with the winterization process, it's our policy to put these things back in place. That way dirt, uh, <laughs> dust, bugs, don't crawl into your water heater and contaminate your water source. So when we're all done with this unit, we then reinstall everything so that we're ready to use it again um, in the spring or the next time you need to take it out. And that just makes the summarization process so much easier, especially when you have us do it. But again, if you kind of remember where you left off or set yourself up so the fact that you actually have this reinstalled, it'll be a lot easier for dewinterizing your coach. Okay. Well, we can probably go back inside and look at the uh, the water pump and its winterization. And Brad, before you do that, uh, we had a, a question that was chatted in from Jerry, um, wanting to know he drained his lines last winter, but now can no longer get water at his sink base, and wants to know if we know why. And he has a 2011 Access 26 foot. Okay. Um, and it's just at the sink. Area. Just at the sink. Everything else has pressure. Sometimes when we do this process and we're putting things back together and in the spring we go out and get things ready to use, we turn on our water pump and we have very low water pressure. It could be, and maybe you've experienced this even during summer operation, that you left your unit in tank fill. So, um, if you have low or no water flow throughout the unit, uh, uh, the tank fill or the city fill um, valve could be an option. One thing that we typically do experience a lot, and it's usually in the galley, so this might be his issue, is that when we're winterizing or working on people's units, um, getting, getting them ready and we have low or no flow at a, at a specific fixture like the galley sink, a lot of times, and it is the aerator. And I'll just pull this one off and we'll look at it. So a lot of times the aerator will be full of um, mineral deposits or this one has, you know, it looks like some black specks. Um, and a lot of times that is really full of stuff. And um, maybe that's his problem. But what we do when that happens is I take that out uh, we can use some CLR, some vinegar, um, some bathroom cleaners that can break uh, soap scum or whatever you have available. Spray that on there, wash that off really well. In severe cases, maybe you need to replace that aerator. But if I was a button guy, I would say that maybe he should check his aerator and um, since it is just his galley faucet. Yeah, and, and actually, just to kind of recap, um, it is possible, Jerry, if you have a 26 QP, you actually may have the um, diverter valve on the uh, utility compartment, which allows you to actually fill your tanks without unhooking your actual city fill. So that's actually how you fill your freshwater tanks. That needs to be in the normal setting um, when you're actually utilizing water. Um, when it also comes through the galley sinks, um, like Brad had mentioned, checking your aerator, um, and, and that's also a really good thing that a lot of homeowners do. Like for example, I live out in a rural area and, and my, my, my shower faucet had once a year, I'll actually place in a lime away or a CLR to get a lot of those hard um, mineral deposits out. You'll actually get better water pressure that way as well. But um, Jerry, if that doesn't provide you that level of troubleshooting, give us a call. We can put you in contact directly with Brad. Um, I can also filter those questions by just having you email me uh, your serial number and a contact number to ron at litson.com. So again, thank you for that question, Jerry. Okay, let's go back. Uh, this, the water pump in this unit is located under the bed. We can go take a look at that and um, how we have it set up for RV antifreeze. Mm 
this is a, a little bit darker location. So again, um, we have the three-way valve here um, that we can that we can look at. And, and just so everybody knows, we're actually in a 31-foot Class C Winnebago motorhome right now. We're actually in the bedroom area. This water pump ha happens to be located underneath the queen bed. So just to give you a, a feel of where we're at right now. <clears throat> So I don't know if you can get a shot in there at all. I got my light on if that helps a little bit. We can see that we have the water pump. The water pump typically, I actually I think always has a screen filter ahead of it. Now this one is located right here underneath this white sticker. Uh, during winterization, that's a good opportunity to take that screen filter apart and, and rinse that out so that you are ready to go again in the spring. Um, but I have <clears throat> the RV antifreeze uh, siphon hose brought out here so that we can look at it. And again, we looked at that valve, uh, that three-way valve before. And when it's in line, we're taking from the freshwater tank. When we turn it up towards this clear hose, then we're using that clear hose to draw the RV antifreeze. So I have that hose out. I have it in a container of RV antifreeze. And uh, they usually have a, a white cap on the end of that hose. Um, have that off, have that in the RV antifreeze, and then we're ready to go uh, use the water pump to push that RV antifreeze through uh, all of our water lines and replace the water that's in there with the RV antifreeze. Now again, this would be the case if we were using the wet method, but now if we do decide to blow the coach out, um, when we're done blowing the coach out, Brad, you might want to also just cover, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we still want to run some RV antifreeze through the water pump because that's an area that cannot be efficiently and effectively blown out. Right, we can't, we can't blow water through the water pump. So here at the dealership, we blow all of our units out and then we use the RV antifreeze um, to go through the water pump. So we want to run some so that we see it through that screen filter and just on the other side. So that would probably be you know what two or three second um, burst of the water pump once we see it drawing it through that clear tube um, so you won't use a lot and then when you go uh, in the spring you'll have some through there but going through your low point drains um, you'll disperse that RV antifreeze relatively quickly and then Brad also just to clarify also with the um, RV antifreeze we had this um, this message um, chatted in from Dennis um, can you cover what areas need to have RV antifreeze run through the P-traps? And that will vary a little bit based on whether or not we're doing the dry method or wet method. Right. Once we've, once we've gotten pink through all of the faucets, the shower, the toilet, the toilet sprayer, <clears throat> the ice maker, the dishwasher, uh, the, the washer and dryer, um, then we want to make sure that we put RV antifreeze down those uh, drains. Now your toilet, your toilet does not need that unless you have a macerator pump toilet. Those then we need to run that RV antifreeze through. But all of our um, foot operated uh, toilets, that's a straight shot to the tank. There is no trap um, in line there so that uh, as long as there's not water sitting in the bowl, uh, we don't need to do that in the toilet. But we do in our shower drains and our sink drains. Those all need uh, you know, a couple of cups of RV antifreeze to go through that P-trap to replace that water. Um, when we talk a little bit more in depth about doing washer and dryers uh, or dishwasher or the dish drawers, um, then we also want to make sure that we pour about a half gallon of RV antifreeze in there and run that through a drain cycle. So anything that has water, we need to replace that with RV antifreeze. And, and Brad, that's probably a good segue. Warren had just chatted in the question <laughs> wanting to know if we could briefly walk through the way to uh, winterize a washer and dryer. And then also while we're at it, we had this question from Warren and then also earlier from um, uh, Dennis, if we could cover how to winterize your ice maker. Okay. Well, first of all, let's let's look at the uh, the washing machine, the clothes washing machine. So, if you have a combo or a, a separate uh, washer, uh, the procedure will be the same. Uh, so, when I start out doing that um, on our lot units or our customer units, I put the unit the the washing machine on a warm cycle. So, usually, number one, cotton cotton regular will let you go to warm, or some other the other settings don't let you go to to warm, they only allow hot or cold. We want it on warm because then we are taking some cold 
uh, from our supply and some hot for our supply so that we are winterizing both the hot and the cold lines to the washing machine. So then I turn it on and I let it go onto a rinse cycle. If you're using air, it's gonna expel all the water in those lines. Um, and you do wanna make sure that, the, that your valves are turned on. Um, and before I forget, because I just thought of this, even if you don't have a washing machine, but your unit has uh, a prep area for an installation of a washing machine, you still need to do that. So let's quickly cover that before we go back to somebody that actually has one. If you have a prep area for a washing machine, uh, the way I do that is I have a short garden hose. I hook that onto the hot side and I run that into the shower or the toilet or a sink, whatever's closest. And then I open up that valve and let that and winterize through that, either air or RV antifreeze. Switch it over to the cold. Then I know that those faucets have been winterized. Even if you've never used those faucets, there is water up into that line. It may not be right there, but it is mostly up to that up to that valve. So we don't want to forget that. Now back to people that have a washer. We go ahead, cotton one lets us to be hot and cold, so I'm on warm. I, I go ahead and I let that start. If I'm using air or RV antifreeze, um, turn my water pump on. If I'm using air, just have my air supply on. And um, let that work through. So. If you're using air, it'll blow, hiss out the water, and then you'll hear just air. If it's RV, you will see that uh, water turn from clear to pink, then we know that we've got the RV antifreeze up through that unit. I then can, once I'm uh, satisfied that, that has those uh, supply lines have been winterized, I can then go to the, um, the drain cycle. So I can stop it, turn it to a spin or a drain cycle, and then let it go. Let it take the water and the antifreeze that you just shot through there and let that take that away. Stop it, dump in about a half a gallon of RV antifreeze so that you can see it through the, the basket, the cylinder that spins, the stainless steel basket. Dump that in there so you can see that uh, still sitting at the bottom of that pan and then go ahead and turn that on drain again. Let it, let, let it finish its drain cycle. So when it does that, it's taking that RV antifreeze through the pump the motorized pump that's in the washing machine expelling it so now the pump is winterized it is then taking it through its drain tube and through its standpipe in the back because that has a p-trap and now that is winterized if you don't if you just have a prepper and you don't have a uh, washing machine there you don't need to winterize the standpipe because you've never put water down it. Winnebago has a sealed um, plastic cap on top of that and you don't have to worry about the drainage part of that, but we need to worry about the supply part of that. All right, cool, so that's a good summary on the washer and dryer. Now if you could briefly cover the ice maker for Warren. Okay, with the ice maker, we do a very similar function. Um, first of all, the manufacturer of the, of the refrigerator has a red tag hanging from uh, the back side of the ice maker. If we go outside and we look at that water valve, it's green or blue, um, it has a supply line to it on the side. That's the line coming from under your sink, the filter uh, under your sink. And then it has a, 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 a white hose coming out the bottom with um, some foil tape wrapped around it. That's the supply line going up to the inside of the ice maker. Now that red tag from the manufacturer says that you can simply remove those two water lines, uh, let the water drain out, or you could drain through uh, that line if you're doing the RV antifreeze or air. Uh, that tag says you can put a plastic bag over those two ends and a rubber band and let those sit um, for the winter. Um, so you could follow uh, the manufacturer's recommendations there or the way we do it here at Litson's is we winterize all the way through. So we blow air or RV antifreeze all the way up through those lines and then into the ice maker. That way we are 100% for sure that we have all of the water out of those lines and out of that uh, electronic valve that's at the back of the water here. So you may have to make a tray of pink ice cubes, um, which actually won't be ice cubes, but they'll be pink. Cool, really good descriptions. We actually had three different people chat in the, the same question. Uh, one from Warren, one from Edison, and one from Steve, um, wanting to know whether or not um, these high quality descriptions of winterizations will be made available 
at a later date. And just to let everybody know that's watching right now, um, we do archive all of our live video webcasts. And uh, later today or early tomorrow morning, we'll actually have this live webcast archived right on our website so you can view it at any point in time um, on our video library on Litson.com and then also on our YouTube channel. So um, really good questions. Uh, go ahead and keep going, Brad. We'll let you finish up. Okay, so we are set up with our RV antifreeze. Then we can go up to our sink area and our water pump switch, which are conveniently located right next to each other on this unit. So we're hooked up. I'm gonna turn our water pump on. So that's on. Then I'm gonna to go to my faucet. I'm gonna start on the hot side. We're running a little, a little clear, nice and clear, 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 clear. Pretty soon that's gonna turn pink. Now we're turning pink. We're good. Now we know that the hot is winterized to this faucet. Then I'm gonna to go to the cold. Same thing, clear, clear, clear. And now we're, and now we're completely pink. <clears throat> so here we know that this faucet, both hot and cold, are winterized. That would do the same thing at your hand sink in your bathroom. Um, then at the shower, I'm gonna let that shower go hot, cold. Um, when I'm done with this, I would then dump, you know, several cups of RV antifreeze down this drain so that I know that the trap is winterized and we would move on to the next one. And Brad's staring me down because I'm grabbing one of his toys here. But this was a question that Bob had chatted in. Bob, thank you. Um, wanting to know if we opt to do the dry method and we blow the coach out, if we can cover what we actually hook up to the uh, city water uh, fill. And I uh, have one of Brad's toys here, which we can actually um, <coughs> provide to you as well. Um, calling into our store, um, speaking with Lonnie, David, or Jim, or anyone in our parts team, we can actually get these out to you as well in terms of how to actually blow your lines out utilizing the dry method. So Brad, if you can just cover that, and then Josh, if you would kind of zoom in on that so we can cover that, and then if you would also cover the PSI on it. Okay, so this is, a, this is a, what we use here at the dealership. Um, there's a lot of different models. There's little $3 plastic ones that you can just screw in and then have a tire uh, fitting on the end um, and all these different ones. We like to use something of this nature because we have several different safety features built into it. So here we start out with a pressure regulator. So this is the same that you would use um, for water, between you and your water source. Yeah, and so this part right here, many of you already have actually on your city fill. This is just a very simple brass uh, water pressure regulator. Yep, so we have that reduction uh, for a safety feature. And then I also have a gauge here um, that I can set uh, my air supply to so that like here in the shop, our air compressors are running at about 120, 130 PSI. We obviously do not want that going here. We want to be restricted to around 40. Uh, most city water pressures are 32, um, some lower, of course, some higher, but that's the importance of having a, a water uh, pressure regulator season around because uh, some campgrounds may have their water pumps turned up to 100 so that on the weekends there's adequate water pressure throughout and you're the guy there on Tuesday who's by himself. Now you have the full 100 PSI. So having a, a $9 pr water pressure will, will save you a lot of headache. And so, and so if you're just a, uh, if you're a residential coach owner, this portion you don't necessarily need to install on your fitting. If you can regulate the PSI from your actual compressor, whether yeah. it be... A lot uh, of compressors will have that right on right. it. Right. So you can dial that down to the 40 and then you'll be set. Um, here this is, this setup here is ready for all applications. So then I'm going to put that to my city water fill. I'm going to put that to uh, my uh, air supply line and adjust my gauge here or at your at your air compressor and we'd be ready to go. If you have a uh, a front like a Freightliner chassis, you got your your air right on board, you could use that, but then you would still need to have this to dial it down. So you could you could do that on the road. Yeah, and Brad, just a couple of follow-up questions that Bob had wanting to know um, first of all, do we sell this? And second of all, if you have a water pressure regulator, do you really need to regulate this? Um, I'm gonna say yes, just because I don't know what your air compressor is set at. Um, 
and just to be safe. I mean, for a $12 fitting at your hardware store, having this having this valve for 12 bucks, that's pretty cheap insurance considering you're gonna to continue to use it the life of your coach. So I'm gonna say, yeah, you should go ahead and do that because then you know for sure. But again, most residential air compressors actually have this built in right into the air compressor. So you probably already have this. This fitting adapter is one that is a little bit more sturdy that we've actually made in our shop. We also offer a different version available for sale. You can contact any of our parts guys, uh, Lonnie, David, or Jim to actually um, um, pull these out. But Brad, while we're on the dry method with the air compressor, a good follow-up question from Craig, wanting to know if we utilize the dry method, um, do we need to open up all the valves individually, such as with the wet method, or can we just open them all up at once? <clears throat> I always open them up individually. Um, and simply because if you got a water line running flat, and we have, if we have all of the valves open at the same time, we have shared that amount of airflow. We could blow so that we think we're doing a good job, but maybe only half of the water is out of that line. And you're, so you're getting air, but you've only removed half of the water. Uh, you close it off, that water all goes back, and now you're in a uh, risk of freezing that up. So when I'm doing it, I go around, do this one, do that one. I go through them all, and I go through them all actually three times just to make sure. So stopping and starting will prevent that blowing half of the water out of the line and allowing uh, that to happen. So like I said, we're hooked up to our city water fill with this. If you have a Santa flush or a black tank flush, you also want to move and blow that out um, because you have water sitting in that from the last time you did a black tank flush. So we want to blow that out. Um, the only time that, that a dry or that uh, this, app, this procedure will not work is if you have aqua hot. If you have an aqua hot heating system, you cannot uh, use the dry method to winterize your unit. Um, inside of your aqua hot, you have a double helix coil. And just like I explained before, we can only blow some of the water out of our water lines. In an aqua hot system, you can blow through it but you will only be taking about a third of the water out of that uh, heating system. So as soon as you're done, all that water is gonna go back and you will freeze and wreck your aqua hot. So aqua hot requires um, a, a wet method. And, and so just for those of you that don't know what aqua hot is, aqua hot is a hydronic heating system only available in the Winnebago Tour and the Itasca Ellipse. And it's an aqua hot hydronic heating system that provides continuous unlimited hot water but is also the replacement source for your furnace. Now, again, that's only on the Winnebago Tour in the Itasca Ellipse unless it's been in installed as an aftermarket accessory. Um, while we're covering the dry method, Brad, uh, two additional follow-up questions from Craig. Wanting to know when we hook up the dry method attachment to the compressor, whether or not we use our diverter valve on the outside in your water compartment on normal or on fill. And you can probably just cover that real quick. Yeah. Um... The answer is both. When you're winterizing, you're gonna be on normal because we're using that air to go all the way around. But and then- we're, And we're just replacing the air um, into the system where the water normally would be, which is what would be on city fill. And then just as part of my habitual process, I turn at the tank fill just to make sure that the line going from the freshwater supply to the freshwater tank is blown out as well. And, so, and that one will go pretty quick. And then a second follow-up question that Craig had, and again, thank you guys, everyone, for chatting in questions because that's what really makes this interactive. Wanting to know, when we do that, do we leave the water pump on or off? Water pump will be off because it won't matter if it's on, but you will not going to be using it because we're providing the water pressure. So our water pump will be off. And uh, a good follow-up question uh, that Dick just had, um, he says that in a previous coach, the RV antifreeze ruined the coating on the bottom of the ice, mark, ice maker trays. Can I drain the water in the ice maker line under the sink by installing a drain, drain tap line in it? Um, you can drain, like the manufacturer says, um, on that red tag at your water heater. If you take that bottom valve or that bottom line off of the lower valve, then you are allowing the water to come um, from the backside of the ice maker down and out. The stuff in your ice maker, I mean, 
it's a freezer it's meant to freeze so that part doesn't need to be winterized but that line outside does so uh, if you're concerned about the RV antifreeze uh, going through there then you can uh, remove that lower line let the water out from the line going up to your ice maker remove the um, the line into the side of that uh, water valve and then use the RV antifreeze through that and let it shoot out on the ground or something and, and here's a great question that just came in and and i'm glad that somebody asked this because it's a, a real nice proprietary advantage that winnebago holds over the competition and steve chatted in this question wanting to know whether or not the volkswagen water heater help from the engine needs something special now i'm going to clarify that and let brad cover the answer but what he's referring to is what many of you may see in your literature is the fact that Winnebago and a lot of their coaches, and it's, it's quite a high percentage, has something called motor aid engine assist, which will literally utilize the heater off of the heater core on the engine to provide you a free source of hot water as you travel down the road. So when you get to your destination, you'll have scalding hot water as a free source of heat. Now that utilizes the antifreeze and coolant lines off of the heater core on the engine. So Brad, can you just touch and answer for our folks out there whether or not they need to do anything to winterize the motor aid function? No, because what we're moving through uh, the motor aid, um, through the coach heat coil and the, the, um, the closed loop on the back of the water heater is antifreeze. Yep. So um, it's the same antifreeze that's in the radiator of your chassis and so it's, it's fine. That's a, a non-maintenance, you can inspect the lines or the connections, like here when we're doing our water heater bypass valve, if you have the motor aid package, it's a good opportunity to inspect those uh, connections for motor aid as well. I think we're back off and running, the floor is yours. Okay, um, when we were talking, about, we're right here at the galley sink and we're talking a little bit about the ice maker. Um, <clears throat> those those uh, units, they all have a water filter. And so, if you know where your bypass valve is, if you have, if you have this style, this uh, Evan Pure uh, water filter, then somewhere in your coach you have or have had a bypass valve uh, like this. Uh, if you don't know where that is, our parts guys have them and they can they can zip them to you. Um, but when we're winterizing, we want to remove whatever water filter we have. So we have these Evan Pures and then they have a bypass plug. So what, what I would do is take this out, just take it outside, let it drain. You're probably at that point throwing this away because you will be replacing this seasonally. Uh, our van feeds will wreck these, so we don't want to winterize through them if you intend on um, using it. Maybe you're just winterizing uh, for the week and going again. Take it out, put in the bypass plug. So uh, if you haven't uh, replaced one of these before, uh, these turn and pop down, they just fall lock in and down like that uh, same that is on uh, the water filter so uh, have your bypass plug in if you have uh, a 3m water filter either this 800 gallon one or the smaller 300 gallon one um, those do not need a uh, bypass plug uh, they have um, their own Basically, as soon as you remove it, when it you goes, remove it, 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 back it, it in. goes yep. into a... There's actually a plunger in there that'll actually keep it in bypass mode. So what we're trying to do here is is bypass the, the water filter so that we can winterize that line that in most of your coaches comes out at the sink on a separate spigot. Um, usually associated here, you have the needle valve that is for the ice maker. You want to make sure that's on. And the one thing that we briefly touched on before was the dish drawer. Uh, also right near your water filter location um, the dish drawer um, has a bypass valve and I spoke wrong this larger uh, 500 gallon or 800 gallon water filter does have a bypass plug the smaller 300 gallon one does not sorry so the small 3m water filter um, does not have a bypass plug but these larger ones do if you're doing the dish drawer uh, we would do the dish drawer uh, winterization uh, very similar to what we do with the dishwasher, the clothes washer. We would um, turn that unit on and let it cycle. Just usually go to a rinse. Um, it'll probably say 12. It's going to take 12 minutes to do that cycle. Uh, we'll go ahead, turn that on, let the air or the RV antifreeze go through, um, let it drain. Then 
uh, uh, open that up, dump in that half gallon of RV antifreeze, close it and let it cycle again and then it will drain that RV antifreeze out, uh, winterize its pump, its line and its standpipe. Actually the dish drawers don't go to a standpipe, they just go right to the, the drain on the sink, the galley sink. But uh, we want to make sure that we run that to drain uh, so that we, we winterize those pumps. Okay, so we've winterized the water lines. Uh, we've covered winterizing a um, washer and dryer. Uh, we've covered winterizing your ice maker. We've covered um, some concerns around uh, winterizing an aqua hot system in the tour and ellipse. We've talked about the dishwasher style, drawer style. What's next? I know we're going to cover batteries, but is there anything else that we need to cover besides the water system and your RV batteries? Well, you know, some of the things that we do when we are winterizing uh, customer units or our uh, units on the lot is we take this opportunity uh, during winterization to treat our rubber seals on our slide outs with, uh, we use a product that uh, Winnebago sells us called Aero 303. Uh, we wipe that down on our rubber seals that um, protects them, UV blocks them, keeps them nice and supple and alive. Um, so we wipe those seals down. Uh, for instance, here we have a crank up power vent. Um, you know, sometimes when you get ready to go again, those babies are stuck down hard as can be. This, um, will, this will prevent that from them. We run down. those up, we wipe that rubber seal down around the top. Then the next time you go to use it or for the remainder of that season, that's going to keep those from sticking. Same thing with some of your tip out windows. We wipe those seals down. So we treat uh, the exterior rubber seals. Uh, with a good uh, UV silicone base protectant that keeps them nice and alive. Yeah, and so what that's doing is that's keeping the UV off of that rubber which will eventually dry it out. Now the bulb seal gaskets around the slide outs are obviously designed to eliminate any permeation of water. And what happens is when the UV hits those they dry out the rubber which will eventually allow them to crack. So what we're covering on the outside are the bulb seal gaskets. I mean even around some of the compartment doors if you have those but really the slide outs the powered ventilator fans. Um, anytime people come into our store, and any store worth their weight in gold, they, we should be doing a complimentary roof sealant inspection for them. But what other areas, Brad, in terms of bulb seal gaskets or rubber seals? I, had for, I hadn't forgotten about compartment doors, but that's a good perfect example, because a lot of times maybe it's one you don't go in very often, or it's the generator one, you don't go in there but a couple times a month, and now it's gonna sit for the winter. Really good opportunity uh, to get those seals um, treated with that UV protector. Um, like, like Ron mentioned, seal inspections give everything a good look over again before you put it away. Um, you're going to do that again when you get ready to go. Um, you know, we had a, a couple years ago, we had a really cold winter. Uh, some, some quick freezes and, and way below uh, zero um, snaps. Even a building, even a RV that was kept in a building, uh, some of our customers, their skylights cracked, um, those types of things. So even if you're in a building, when you get ready to go again in the spring, you want to make sure you give those things a good thorough inspection. Um, so let's go for batteries. Well, we do, an, uh, no, okay, batteries. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to do a fuel additive. I'm going down my winterization list. So we do fuel additives uh, in our lot units uh, in the winter and, and if customers request it. So uh, we have a diesel additive uh, that we add that will uh, allow for cold weather starting. Uh, we treat the fuel uh, as recommended on the label as far as how many ounces per gallon. We run the generator uh, to get that treated fuel uh, in and through the generator um, as well as run the chassis so that in the middle of winter we can go for that surprise trip or uh, for us when we need to move uh, units in and around the lot. So uh, a diesel fuel uh, treatment is, is also important. Or if you have gasoline uh, chassis, go ahead and use something like stable uh, or a, a fuel additive that is meant for uh, short-term storage. Okay, right. fuel treatment, that's a good point, thank you. And you know, if you are like up here uh, and you're down south, like some of our customers locally, uh, they're down south, back up north, back down south again. Uh, we always want to think about up here, uh, we're buying a winter blend uh, of diesel, so that already has some special properties that allow it to, to run more efficiently uh, in cold weather. 
but if you've went down south you come back back and forth if you're down south you've purchased what we call around here summer blend um, an untreated or an unmixed uh, fuel ready uh, just for summer use so you may want to do some management of your fuel and fill up I don't know Kansas City for instance for some of our customers coming north um, and you get to that line where you want to purchase your your blended fuel or if you've bought fuel down south and you're putting in the storage up north you definitely want to put a uh, a fuel additive in okay Ron's itching to talk about batteries I've got some more questions too from our callers so. <laughs> all right go ahead so when we when we're uh, here at the dealership, uh, also as part of our winterization process, we then uh, take the opportunity to inspect our batteries. So uh, we want to inspect our connections, make sure they're tight, non-corroded, um, so we can check those. If you have a wet, uh, flooded battery, we want to pop those covers off, take a good look in there, make sure that we have adequate water level um, in our batteries. If we do not, then we top them off, of course, with distilled, distilled water. Um, if you are removing your batteries to bring them in the house uh, for winter, you know, for winter storage, that's a good opportunity um, um, to get those taken out. Um, protect your uh, positive power uh, feeds. That way, if you do start up the unit and move it, or you have it plugged in, you're not having that positive feed grounding out uh, or shorting out in that uh, battery compartment. So. Battery maintenance, very important. You probably all know that because you know that they cost a substantial chunk of change if we uh, need to replace them. So well-maintained battery uh, will serve you well. So what most people do, and correct me if I'm wrong, Brad, and we can actually uh, deconnect the batteries or disconnect, I should say, your batteries for you. Um, most people will charge those, bring them inside, um, preferably to um, an interior basement or an interior wall of a garage to prevent them from freezing because most of the RV batteries that are out there are flooded batteries as Brad had said so they're wet cell batteries so we want to keep that water from freezing which will eventually cause a dead cell is that a, is that a pretty good description yeah uh, <clears throat> a, a healthy battery fully charged put into storage that's going to be fine but if your batteries are a little sketchy and you're concerned about their condition um, Yes, if a battery, a low battery can freeze and that can crack it or uh, kill a cell. So, you know, you definitely want to, if you're leaving them in, you want to leave them for the winter fully charged. So you want to keep those topped off. So maybe you're checking them a couple of times during the winter um, just so that a low, because a low battery or a drain battery will freeze up. So again, good points. And with respect to those RV batteries, again, that's if they are wet cell batteries. A lot of our coaches now are coming with AGM batteries or absorbed glass mat batteries. Now those are maintenance free batteries and those don't need to be removed because literally you can keep them charging all winter long and put them away fully charged and they'll come out fine. Is that accurate as well? I would okay. agree. Yep. So good points. Also, with respect to this live webcast, again, we just covered uh, wet cell batteries, um, having them go into winter with a, with a dedicated charge, or possibly even removing the batteries and bringing them inside your home, uh, obviously away from furnaces and, and things like that, or near an interior wall of your garage. Um, also keep in mind with respect to this video, um, we do have this video will be archived later today or tomorrow morning. You'll be able to watch it um, as many times as you like to get Brad up over 40,000 YouTube views as he's at right now with his original winterizing video. But again, keep in mind those are all available as well. So we're going to keep the, the chat lines open here for a minute. I also had a question from Lou, Brad, if you could cover wanting to know how to utilize an electric winterizing kit. And I'm guessing if that's the case, he probably has a Winnebago Chieftain or an Itasca Sunflyer. Electric winter. Oh, so he has a like a unit with a, a tank that has the RV antifreeze in it, and then we have an electronic valve. Um, and, and with some of those, you actually have a tank for the RV antifreeze, and a lot of those did. Um, there were also some that were built with just the electronic switch, and really what that's doing is it's taking the place of your water pump switch. It's very simple yeah. what it's doing. So those, those, like instead of having this as a bypass valve, it has an electronic valve, usually in your bathroom, in the 
wardrobe cabinet. So instead of us going and operating this valve, you're pushing a button that electronically opens and closes the water heater bypass valve. And then also that open and closes the RV uh, siphon uh, valve as well. So, so those, um, you're gonna winterize the exact same way that we're doing with this. Some have their own tank and I think the ones that I've dealt with, there was a tank like in a side wardrobe cabinet that you right. lifted up a panel and there was a, uh, a plastic tank down there. So that would have its own built-in tank or we have our own gallon of RV antifreeze that we put the tube into and uh, winterize through. A uh, good question that just came in from Mark and then I also want to cover when, are we, when we should or should not run the engine and generator, but Mark just chatted in a question wanting to know what electronics should be removed. Electronics? Yep, audio, visual equipment, satellite receivers, things like that. <clears throat> I don't know that we have any criteria on um, the items that Winnebago supplies, you know, the TVs, um, those types of things, they they know that those will be fine through those through those items. All right, so what a great number of questions today. We really appreciate everybody chatting in with literally an all-time high attendance on what has been a very value-added um, segment on winterizing. So I want to thank uh, Brad Buffington, one of our factory-trained uh, RV service technicians, and for all of you for joining in. Uh, just a couple of other things. I just want to remind all of you that at any point in time, we can actually do a live interactive presentation on any of our in-stock RVs with any of our factory trained sales consultants from the comfort of your own home, your own office. Also one last item, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month and many of you actually have seen me throughout different high definition videos with two different honorarium badges. The first band is in honor of the support of our military and the second during the month of October is for Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Please, I encourage all of you to stop into your local Chevrolet dealer during the month of October where participating dealers on select Saturdays during the month of October will kick off the American Cancer Society Making Strides Against Breast Cancer Demo Drive Program. Well, Chevrolet will make a $10 donation for every test drive that you do during the month of October. So please stop into your local Chevrolet dealer during the month of October. And for all of you RVers out there, enjoy fall. What a great season with leaves turning as we get ready for our next live video webcast next month. If you have topics that you want to see, shoot me an email at ronatlitson.com and we'll cover those during the month of November. Get out there and go RVing.